then they get silent. Okay, thanks everyone for coming to this beautiful presentation. Uh, thank you for choosing this over all the other also very interesting presentations. Um, today I will tell, tell you something about metrics driven development. And metrics driven development is what we at Swiss use to basically get our products to be the best they are, especially our AI product. Uh, first, I'll tell you something about myself. I am Bartanas, as you can see. Uh, I work at Swiss uh, with Matthias and all the other people, all the other lovely colleagues there. Um, and I mostly work at Vragen.ai. It's our retrieval algorithm generation solution, which everyone who has been to Frederick's great talk will know um, what it is. Otherwise, I'll explain it later, don't worry. Um, and also, I'm currently in the final, final stage of my studies at the Free University of Amsterdam as my Masters of AI, where I'm really writing this paper, Improving and Measuring Web Trustworthiness. Um, in, other, uh, in other words, I may have thought about numbers and why we need numbers. Okay, why do we need metrics driven development? So, everyone here, all the way be here, wants to improve their products or we want to improve the way we do things. Every good product is uh, a result of iteration. Iteration needs a, needs a steering way, we need a way to iterate. So, how do we iterate? How do we know that we are making the right choices? How do we know that we are actually improving? How do we know that we are spending our time wisely? This is why we use metrics driven development. Metrics allow us to know, or not guess, the effect of what we are actually doing. So, I have the first example here of my actual daily, uh, daily schedule, daily work. Currently, in our RAC solution, in our Vagable AI solution, we are working with ChatGPT, but we're trying to change the lab. And I need to know which of these answers is better. So, I asked Drupal of Vagable.ai, a demo we made about the Drupal website, I asked a question. How do I set course headers? I asked it with both modes. And I need to know which is the better answer. I'm not a Drupal developer. I know I'm <laughs> in the perfect place here to get a good, good answer for this. But I need to know which is the better answer. And I need to know this not for just one question, I need to know this for thousands of questions. So how do I do this? Do I just look at this and say, yeah, I like the left better, I like the left better? No one? Everyone hates the left? You probably have to read it then. <laughs> I don't know. And I hope you guys know, but you, as you can see, even very experienced Drupal developers, and even in a perfect place for Drupal developers, I can't really get a quick answer for this. And we need, we need an answer for thousands and thousands and thousands of questions. So, what do we do? We use metrics. Metrics allow me to know, even when I don't actually know the answer, just by picking the right metrics and picking things I want, which of these models is performing better. Um, sadly, you can see the right, but at the right we see that both of these metrics are one. We see that it's a faithful answer, faithful to the sources, and it's relevant to the, uh, relevant to the question as such. And this question, Lama 3 performs better, and we might choose Lama 3 for our next iteration. So, what does this metric driven development look like? It looks like this, this beautiful circle over here. We build, we measure, we learn, we build, we measure, we learn. So, what do we do? We first define our goals clearly. What do we want to achieve? And then we think, how do we actually measure what we want to achieve? For example, what we wanted to achieve with our factual AI thing, we want this to get the truthful, correct, trustworthy answers. How do we actually measure that? I'll show you that later. Um, use, and then we use these metrics to check how well it's performing currently. For example, how quickly is my website responding? How, how many people are buying my products? Etc. We make an iteration and we make an improvement. We measure this improvement. We check if the improvement is actually better. And then we iterate further up in this version. As I'm an AI developer, I'll start explaining this about AI and how we evaluate AI. So, we have two types of measures, two most important types of evaluations. We have supervised evaluations and unsupervised evaluations. Supervised evaluation asks us to give us give a data set. And I label data set for, oh, this is the correct answer, or this is what we want to achieve here, this is what we want. This label data set is labeled by humans which is very important. This also means that this input data is predetermined. 
So we can't just all, uh, we can't easily add something to the new data set and we can't just use new data to the first thing to look at by you. We also have unsupervised evaluations. This means that the input data is unlabeled and that humans didn't necessarily need to look at it. So it can take you and you and any input data you want to read. So, famous examples of supervised evaluation are recall, precision, mean squared error, accuracy, etc. And on the other side, we have the more clustering ways. So, you can see a very famous supervised data set in the ImageNet data set. Um, where humans actually stand up, oh, this is a dog, this image is a dog, this image is a sailing vessel, this image is a femoron, and the images that the beautiful booth outside, where you take the nice picture, where it was trained on, or oh, this is a cyberpunk Im image, for example, that's where it all started with the ImageNet models. We also have an unsupervised model, we just have a bunch of data, we don't really know what it is, we start clustering it up, oh, this goes together, this goes together, this goes together. So, what are the pros of supervised evaluation? Supervised evaluation has a golden standard quality, is really what we want and what we want to base our AI on. As it aligns values with human values and can be used as a benchmark for what our model is achieving. However, it's very expensive. It's incredibly expensive. We need so much data for AI and it's just not doable to do this all with humans. Even when even the biggest companies, OpenAI, Google, everyone, they try to use as much supervised evaluation as possible and they hire complete farms in India just to give us data. Every time you build a catch up, you're actually providing supervised data, but it's still not enough. We also have, it also copies human biases. If you think this type of text is good, that might, lead, that might be because of your cultural ideas, it might be because of who you are as a person. Someone else might have a very different idea. It's time consuming. And as I said, you can't just add new data, it's very sad. So, we have unsupervised evaluation to solve these problems. It allows us to automate these tests. It's cheap, it's quick, it's scalable, it's perfect, it's perfect, it's exactly what we want. Except that it's far less reliable, it's harder to understand what these numbers actually mean. I just showed you some numbers, it's one, it's one, what does that mean? Who knows? The underlying test can also have biases. So for example, what we see is that one of these tests might be might perform differently in Dutch than it does in English, and it relies on some certain assumptions. For example, what we assume uh, with the faithfulness, and we assume with, with actually distance to the sources, does that mean that's the right answer? Is that really what we want, that it listens to the source? If the sources say, oh, Paris is the capital of England, do we want to see that? Or do we just want a better answer? So, I'll tell you a case study. I'll tell you what I'm actually working on with my great colleagues at Swiss. Uh, in the Vraag.ai uh, product. So here, our metrics driven development case study. I'll show, first show you a little video about Vraag.ai, then I'll give you a bit more explanation, and then we'll go from there. So, what you can see, Vraag.ai helps you, you ask a question. And you don't do keyword search, but you get actual search. So here we see an answer, just like I showed you at the beginning. But how do we look for these answers? How do we know if this answer is the best answer we can get? So a little bit more about Vraag.ai. What is Vraag.ai? Vraag.ai works with the three-block method generation. That means, ask a question, I give it, uh, I give the large language model information from the knowledge base, just as you explained very well. Um, I use the relevant knowledge that I give to the large language model to give you an answer. So we give answers based on our own website, on our own data. And with this, come, come a lot of new ways that we need to measure this, because we can't just say, oh, this is better. No one can read all these answers, no one knows the answer to all of these questions. We have hundreds of domains, tens of thousands of questions, and millions of sources. No one can read all of this. So, what are our goals? Our goals are to give the most trustworthy answer we can. So, what does trustworthy mean for us? Because just mentioning trustworthiness, how do we do that? So, what the trustworthy means for us is three things. An answer is faithful to the sources we give it. An answer is faithful to what you put in. 
So that means all the facts come from these sources, all the facts come from this context, and none of it is actually contradicting these sources, and no new information is introduced by the large language model. This is how we look for hallucination. Then, we ask another question. Is this actually a relevant question? Or is this actually a relevant answer? If you ask me, um, how, do I, how do I build a Drupal website, and I say I like pizza, I do like pizza, it's true, it's faithful. Uh, however, it's just not relevant, so it's not a good trustworthy answer. And finally, we want our source to be useful for the answer. We don't want to give too many sources because it's expensive, and also it helps to keep the LLM on track if you get the, keep the amount of sources to a minimum. So, what do we want? It does not answer what sources are, we do not provide information, and we want to give the answers in a timely manner. These are all things we measure. And how do we measure this? And how do we evaluate this? We use both both supervised and unsupervised evaluations. We use supervised evaluations before we put a model into production to te test whether the model is actually viable, to test whether our model will ever really perform better than anything, anything else. And then when we use the production, we start using unsupervised. Um, the unsupervised uh, evaluation will also be done during the, during the first testing, just to make sure that it's worked correctly. So, what we have? Our supervised data set is a killed data set. It's a data set that's based on Wikipedia, and it basically just is millions of, or, well, hundreds of thousands of questions, with hundreds of thousands of documents, and people annotated who, what is the correct document, what's the correct answer here, and do we get this correct answer. We can test this, we can measure this clearly, we can measure this with the human labels. Then we also have the unsupervised. So when someone asks a new question in a new domain, we want to know, does it actually work in this domain? Do, does our product provide the right answers here, and do we actually get what we want here? So, we have something called ARIES for this. Um, the, the version we're using is ARIES, the GPT version, which means that we also have a large language model to basically evaluate itself, which has been proven to work very well in, uh, well, in academic research. So, I'll go give you a bit more information about this now. So, the supervised metrics, what do we do? We have the skill data set, we, have, we know the answers, we know what the correct answers are, and we know what the correct context is. So we can look up, did I modify the correct context? Then we give the whole correct answers. We do this by give, looking for position and recall in the context search, in the context search. So, did it find precision? Did, did, all the, did all the context that it found belong to actually what we want? So that is it actually the correct context that we provided? And recall, did we find all the context we needed? The advanced score is simply harmonious, meaning that's often used in AI just to make it, sure, make, make it easier to train them. Although we train, don't train them with work. Also, we check the answer. We check for an exact mesh. So, is that the answer our large language model provides the exact same as the humans provide? So, all of these questions have an answer like, oh, uh, who's the, who won the Golden Ball 2022 line list? Whatever. Just a, just a really quick, dirty, two, two word answer. We want to know if it's the exact same, and also we check the bar score. And the bar score is an LLM, a large language model based score, that basically looks, is it close together? Does it belong together? And when it's, when the answers are close together, it means that the bar score is higher. Uh, what this takes advantage of is that if it's not an exact match, which it often isn't, large language models are quite reliable, then we still know if the LLM got close enough and actually got a relevant answer. Then we use some unsupervised metrics. The unsupervised metrics we use are generated by a large language model. As I said, we currently use uh, GTT or GTT 3.5 for this. Um, and what we check is context relevance, faithfulness, and also relevance. <coughs> And what this means is for context relevance, we ask for every piece of context we give it, but every chunk we give it, and we give it 4 to 20 chunks in some cases. Um, we ask, did this chunk actually contribute to this answer? Did, is this an important chunk? Is this important information for this answer? And does this belong to this answer? Can we answer this question with this chunk? So if it's not relevant, it gets a zero. If it's relevant, it gets a one. And that's how we know if our models perform correctly. Then, we have faithfulness and answer relevance. So this is how we check our answer. And we do the same thing as we did with the context relevance. However, now we ask for every source, did this source help, uh, is this 
artifacts in this course actually relied on this answer and did this answer not contradict any of the facts in this source. We also asked it with all the sources together just to see that are none of the, are none of the facts contradicted, are none of the facts, are none of the facts made up, and that's how we know that we give an answer based on your data. Furthermore, we have the answer about this. So you simply ask, you get the answer, you get the question. Is this answer wrong? Does this answer belong to this question? Did it answer the question? Is the user satisfied? Basically. And when we're very lucky, we got we get to our AI inbox, and when we're very lucky, I can see some feedback in there because every point of feedback allows me to know in a supervised way if the user is happy with the answer we gave it. And this is extremely important. For example, in Drupal, the AI is one of our things uh, that you can test later. Every question, every point of feedback, every like, every dislike means that some that a web developer, one of, one of you guys basically, gave this answer that an expert let us know, or oh, this is what I want, or this is not what I want. So this allows us to track our model performance very well. The AI inbox also gives us insight into all of the methods we have and all of the domains we have. Um, what that means is that the domains are very much different from each other, and that the domain, that how one model performs on one domain can be radically different from how a model performs on a different domain. For example, some domains are in Dutch, some are in English, some uh, some ask really huge questions about academic sources, some are just, well, where do I leave my garbage? And there's a huge difference in how the models perform for each of these domains. So we can we can specify which model we want for each domain rather than just for one than just finding the best overall model, which is very hard to do and just a fool's error for you. What the AI inbox looks like for us is like this. So what we can see here is a date. Which question was asked? When was this question asked? What was the question? What feedback did we get? We see some very nice likes here, of course. It's a great problem. Um, how long did it take? Is it faithful? Is it relevant? And where the, was the context also relevant? So we know if we put multiple models together and put multiple models next to each other, which of these models is performing better? Which of these models should be interface verbal? Which of these parameters should be tuned further? What do we want? Do we want a new large language model? Do we want the temperature higher, the temperature lower? What do we want? And this is how we measure this. Thank you all for coming. Are there any questions now? <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I saw uh, old relevancy, source relevance. Yeah. What does that precisely mean? So um, we have these chunks that we allow that we give to the to the large language model. And for each of these chunks, we check does it actually belong to the answer and does it actually belong to the question. So it's a, if I ask a question, that's the context relevance. Yeah. Okay. So if I ask a question about pizza and I give you a lot of sources about cars, those are not relevant. If I ask a question about pizza and the question about pizza is answered by the source, then it's relevant. Can I also understand like that actually scores the quality of your retrieval? Yeah, that's how we score our retrieval yeah. in the supervised way. So um, we also have the kill, of course. That's how we test retrieval beforehand. But retrieval changes dramatically based on based on embeddings, based on the embedding schema, based on the language, based on whatever. Um, and that's why we want to do it per domain as well. And that's why we need them in supervised way. And that's how we that's the best approximation we got. Uh, and that's how we test our tool with that. Is there any difference in performance between the two, uh, two approaches, the supervised and unsupervised? Did you yeah. measure that also? Um, well, uh, I didn't personally measure it. Uh, the unsupervised uh, methods is the AWE score. We got it from an MIT paper. Um, they measured it. Uh, what we see is that their closest to the human evaluation currently, and they're about 15 to 30 percent off. So those scores are quite a bit off of the human scores. However, it is still a good way that if our scores there are higher, probably our human scores are also higher. Uh, that's how we measure it. Um, but unsupervised evaluation will always be further off from supervised evaluation because we want human metrics, we want humans to use it, and we want humans to like it.
No more questions? How high was our kill score? Uh, well, it depends on which model exactly, um, but we get kill scores up to about 70 or 80% correct right answers. Um, with the unsupervised evaluation, you get a bit lower, but it's also very domain based, it's Dutch, that's hard for most models. Uh, but we do tend to get quite good scores. Uh, yeah. 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 No more questions? Nathalie, thank you very much, and I hope you have a great <laughs> <laughs>